pray. Heavenly Father, in your divine wisdom and love, you have sent your apostles, prophets, as well as the evangelists for our spiritual edification, for our preservation, and for our protection. Grant us grateful hearts for your sending of those prophets whom you chose to deliver the good news of our unconditional deliverance from the bondage of sin and death. Help us to always rejoice in this good news of salvation. As your witnesses prophesied of the future coming of our Savior to perform his work of redemption, let us now look forward to his second coming in majesty and glory to be our conquering and reigning King and our Prince of Peace. We ask that you would bless our worship here this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.
please rise. This morning we'll be following the order of service on page 12 and following in the front of the worship supplement. This Sunday is the last Sunday in Advent, and as we contemplate on the fulfillment of God's promises, we're reminded of the many blessings that are ours through the fulfillment of God's promise of a Savior. And it is in these blessings that we rejoice. We begin our worship service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and to serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserved only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all of your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May the Lord give to us the strength to live according to his will. Amen. Stir up your power and come. Help us by your great might so that whatever is hindered by our sins may be accomplished by your great mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> first reading for this Sunday is found recorded for us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. This is a section that many of us have memorized in our catechism days, emphasizing the Savior, who he is and what he has done for us. But surrounding this verse about the one mediator between God and men, the Apostle Paul also reminds us of the role that we play in this fallen world, bringing our prayers to God that we might continue to be active in preaching the gospel, 
And through the Lord's blessing that that gospel would continue to spread throughout the world, the one message of that one mediator. We read from 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, I exhort first that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Throughout the history of the world, in particular the last 2,000 years since Christianity, but it's true before that as well, there have been many times where Christianity has been persecuted, where it has not been allowed to be publicly proclaimed. And so here, the Apostle Paul, who lived through that period, was not, it was not legal for him to proclaim Christ, or he would be beaten, or imprisoned, or even put to death as he was. Praise that Christians would bring their petitions to the Lord, asking that God would give us the freedom to be able to proclaim the one truth that human beings need. Now, we live in a world and in a country in which we have the freedom to boldly witness to Jesus, to gather together in worship, but that isn't the case in all nations of the world today. Many of our fellow Christians throughout the world live under persecution and are not able to freely proclaim the name of Jesus or to gather together for worship. And the Apostle Paul's words for us are still very, very fitting that we continue to bring our prayers before God, that he would give us the ability, whether it's through persecution or through freedom, to announce that one Savior from sin and death in Jesus Christ. Our Old Testament reading is from Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. Haggai was a prophet, one of the last prophets of the Old Testament, before the coming of Jesus, about 400 years before the time of the birth of Jesus. The children of Israel had been brought, been, been brought back from captivity to Israel where they had rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. But it wasn't a pretty thing. They had to be encouraged even just to put what they could together as a place of worship for the true God. And here the prophet Haggai comes to the believer's in that era and reminds them that while the temple itself didn't look like much, God was going to bless what happened there through the preaching of the word. And it would ultimately be through that temple that the Lord Jesus himself would come to bring deliverance from sin and from death for sinners. We read from Haggai chapter two. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, in a, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake the nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place... I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. The people of Haggai's day not only saw their little temple that looked poor and mean compared to the temple of Solomon, but they also didn't trust the Lord like they should. The Lord reminds them that the ability to glorify the temple comes from him in the ability to give the funds that are necessary to physically beautify the temple but even more importantly, to bring through his word the message of forgiveness of sins that is found in Jesus as the savior of the world. All of that is in the power of God, both physically as well as spiritually, for us to come to the desire of all nations, that thing that all people need in Jesus. We don't always admit it. We don't acknowledge that we need Jesus, but he is the one thing that all human beings need because of sin. And it is him 
that we celebrate today and tomorrow. Please rise. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and treasure it. to make confession of our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. This can be found on page 15 in the worship supplement. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the singing of hymn 702 in the Brown Hymnal.
rights. Grace, mercy, and peace be to each one of you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word of God which we're meditating on this morning is found recorded for us in John chapter 1. The verse is found in your bulletin, verses 29 through 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. This is the word of our God. Please be seated. In the name of our Savior Jesus, whose birth we continue to celebrate because of its meaning and importance for us and for the whole world, dear fellow redeemed. Many times, people, whether they have a Christian background or a non-Christian background, struggle with all sorts of questions. Questions that they want to know answers about. Sometimes questions that the Bible doesn't offer answers for. I'm sure that each one of us have wrestled with the, our own questions that we have about now and about the future, about heaven, about hell, about who God is, about how he has done it, things that don't always make sense to us. And we're not the only ones. No doubt you've dealt with other people in your life who have come to you with questions, looking for answers. It seems that many times as we wrestle with the questions that we have regarding spirituality, about eternal life, about hope, all of those things, that we often get bogged down with the unimportant questions. Have you ever noticed that? A lot of times the questions that we have, while they might be important to us, they might have particular meaning to us, in the big scheme of things, they're really not all that important at all. Will my dog be with me in heaven? That might be an important question to you right now, but does it really impact our lives in eternity? Not really. And sometimes what happens is we get so focused on the little questions like that that we lose sight of the big answers that God has given to us in his word. Many times when I'm dealing with individuals who are struggling with particular questions regarding their Christian faith or, or maybe even why they should trust the Bible, why they should trust Christianity, we have to take a stop and, and break away from those little questions and back up and ask some bigger questions. Does God exist? Now that's an important question. And if they say, well, no, I don't think that he does, well, then we've got a starting place, don't we? We can start right there. Let's talk about how we can be certain that God exists. We can look through the pages of Scripture. For example, maybe their question is, I don't know that I can trust the Bible. I'm not sure that it's God's word. Let's start there. How can we be certain that the Bible is God's word or that God exists? Well, we didn't come into being by chance. That just doesn't make sense. It makes sense that there's some greater being that has created us and put us here. And when we look at the Bible and we open up its pages and we see the promises that God made, the prophecies that he foretold, and we see how they were fulfilled one after another, not only in the person of Jesus, but just in history. And we find out that the Bible is 
validated in geography and in history, we realize this isn't just a human book. It has to be something more. And when we start to answer those questions, we know that God exists. We know that the Bible is more than just a human book, that it comes from God. It must be. Then we can start to get to the really important questions. Well, if I know that God really exists, and I know that the Bible is more than just a human book, then we have to ask ourselves the question, then why did God give us the Bible? And that is what John is telling us in the verses of our text today. He's telling us why it is that God, not that he exists, but why it is that he's planned out this salvation that he's recorded in the Old and the New Testament. Why it is that this book has been preserved for us. Because it points us to the problem of our sin and it points us to the solution for that problem of sin which God came to accomplish for us. And when we get to that, all of those other little questions, they really don't matter. When we realize God sent a savior for me and that is his main purpose. That's what he wants for me. All of those other questions that I might have and might want answers for, those things, they can wait till I get to heaven. And if they're important, I'll know the answer. And if, or, if they aren't, I won't care. But God does give us the answers for the questions that are really important right here, right now, today, in his word. John reminds us that we have reason to rejoice as Christians because God has fulfilled his promise of salvation. He has given us the deliverance from sin, from death, and from the power of the devil through the fulfillment of those promises in Jesus. In these verses, John points to two things about this coming Savior, the fulfillment of God's promises to us. He points to a Savior who is and always has been the eternal Son of God. And then he also points us to a Savior who takes away the sin of the world. We pray that the Holy Spirit would bless our study and meditation, give us reason to rejoice through the fulfillment of these promises. Amen. It's fitting that we have this text this Sunday after focusing on what we have focused on the last three weeks in our midweek Advent services. During our midweek Advent services, we were hearing and reminded of the prayers that were offered by Elizabeth, Mary, and Zacharias, respectively. And it ties into the person and the work of Jesus, as well as the person and the work of John the Baptist. Last Thursday, Pastor Radical reminded us of what Zacharias knew, what Elizabeth knew two weeks earlier with Pastor Now, and what Mary knew two weeks ago. And all of this fits in with John the Baptist and what he has to say here in John chapter 1. 30 years before this text, before this event recorded by John, John's parents knew about the promises of God. Elizabeth declares that very, very clearly when Mary comes to visit her. We heard this two weeks ago. Elizabeth said to Mary who came to her, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth understood even before Mary had announced her pregnancy to her by the Holy Spirit that she was pregnant and that she was pregnant with the Savior. How is it that my Lord, the mother of my Lord, would come to me, Elizabeth says. She understood the promises going all the way back in the Old Testament of a virgin birth. From Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Elizabeth understood those promises and she understood that those promises had been fulfilled through Mary. We fast forward nine months to Zacharias and the birth of John the Baptist, or just a little bit less than nine months. Zacharias was aware of John's role, that he would be the forerunner for the coming Savior. Zacharias said, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, 
for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people through the remission of their sins. Zechariah, being a priest, understood the fulfillment of the role of John, that this too was a prophecy in the Old Testament. In Malachi chapter 3, we were told, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. So 30 years earlier, John's parents, both Zechariah and Elizabeth, understood the messianic prophecies. They understood that God had made a promise to send a savior. They understood that that promise had been fulfilled through the birth of Jesus by Mary and that their son John would play a role in preparing the way for that savior in a very special way. John had come to understand his role too. He'd come to understand that he was the one whom God had sent to point people to the coming savior. John tells us in our text that this is the whole reason that he came baptizing. That his role was to prepare people through the remission of their sins, through repentance and forgiveness by preaching that message of law and gospel to the people. And he had told the people, even before our text, that the Savior was coming. He knew it. He said, when I see him, I'll point him out to you. And that's exactly what John does in our text. But there's something interesting here. If you, if you back up 30 years, John was born before Jesus was. John was the elder of the cousins, the relatives. And yet in our text, John tells us something unique about his relationship with Jesus. In verse 30, he says, this is he of whom I said, after me, comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now that doesn't make any sense at all. If you go back to the beginning of Luke, John was born before Jesus was. How is it possible that Jesus could be before him? We can understand how he could be preferred before him, but to come before him, that's another question altogether. There might have been people that knew the relationship between John and Jesus that might have asked that very question, might have wondered what it was that John was speaking about or referring to. But John is referring to the fact that Jesus as the second person of the Godhead had always existed. He was the eternal God. He was there at the very beginning of the world when the world was created. In the opening verses of this same chapter, not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the eternal Son of God, whom God sent into the world, who existed before John and was preferred above John. And it is to that Jesus that John points here in our text. Everything that was made was made by this individual that I am pointing you to right now. This is the eternal God. This is the Savior we have been waiting for. John points us to a Savior, but not just any Savior, not just the Savior that the Jews wanted, but to the Savior that the Jews needed. The the Jews were simply waiting for a savior that would be a human being who would lead a great mighty battle of warriors against the Romans and drive them out and give them their land back. God says, no, I have a better savior in mind for you, a savior that you really need who is going to not defeat the Romans, but defeat the devil and the forces of death. That is the savior that you need and that savior is the eternal son of God. In the very last verse of our text, John says, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Jesus was the Savior that we needed, the eternal Son of God, 
come into the world to save us. But that Savior comes for a very specific purpose. John describes the nature or the person of the Savior, that he is the eternal Son of God. But he also describes the work of that Savior. The Savior would be one who would take away the sin of the world. The Savior had been sent for a purpose, but not the purpose that the Jews thought he would be sent for. He came for a greater purpose. John points to Jesus in the opening verse of our text and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John points to Jesus as the fulfillment of everything that God had spoken of in the Old Testament. Now, this might seem strange to us in the 21st century. But when John pointed to Jesus in the first century in Israel and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, they understood exactly what he was saying. Their mind immediately, when they heard Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, would flash back to the Passover, to the sacrifice of that perfect, spotless, male, young lamb that was killed and its blood was sprinkled upon the doorposts of the homes in Egypt. The blood of the lamb by whom the Israelites' lives were spared. God delivered them from death. It was this Lamb of God that was pointing to a greater Lamb of God yet to come. When they heard about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, they might have thought of the scapegoat that was brought into the temple upon whom the priest confessed the sins of the people and he was led out into the wilderness never to be seen again. Their mind would have gone right to the goats and the bulls that were sacrificed day in and day out in Israel over and over again as a way of mediating between sinful mankind and a just and a holy God. When John the Baptist said, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, they understood exactly what John was saying, that this is the one whom God has told us about for 4,000 years, who we have been waiting for, and finally, he has come. Now, there's something deeper here that we also need to understand. John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's a truth here that not everyone acknowledges. And that truth is that we are all sinful. That we all need a savior. He says he takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't say he just came to take away the sin of some people who were really bad, but not those who weren't quite as bad. They can take care of it on their own. Jesus comes as the savior for all people because all all of us are buried under a depth of sin that we cannot separate ourselves from or free ourselves from. Jesus comes for that purpose. We understand that truth, or at least we should. When we gather together in worship, it's one of the first things that we do when we come into church together. We acknowledge our sinfulness before a just and a holy God. It doesn't matter if it's the liturgy that we use today page 12 of the worship supplement, I am altogether sinful from birth, you confessed earlier. We acknowledge that from birth, this is what we would call original sin, we are sinful, that we've inherited the sin of our forefathers and their forefathers and their forefathers all the way back to Adam. We acknowledge that we are altogether sinful from birth. But then we go on and we say, even in addition to that, in countless ways I have sinned against you. We can't just blame it all on Adam and say, well, it's all his fault. We're reminded, I have sinned against God in what I have thought, in what what I have said, what I have done. My own sin is added to the sin that I have inherited from my parents. That's what we call actual sin. And Jesus comes to remove both of those types of sin, 
to remove original sin that we have inherited and the actual sins that we have committed in thought, in word, and in deed. Jesus comes to take away the sin of the world. Yes, in countless ways, we have sinned against God over and over and over again. And Jesus has paid the debt for every single one of those sins for every single sinner who has ever lived. Jesus tells us, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. All of that came from within us. And Jesus came to pay for every one of those sins. He was true God, begotten of the Father from eternity. He was also true man, born of the Virgin Mary. True God and true man. And that's exactly what was necessary in order for him to come and to be our Savior, the one who would take away the sins of the world. He had to be both true God and true man in order to carry out the work of redemption to be our Savior. The writer to the Hebrews says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that is Jesus, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. No doubt there are questions that you have. Questions about your faith. Questions about the future. Questions about the Bible. It's not bad to have questions. It's good to ask questions. But it's more important that we answer the most important questions. And that's exactly what the Bible does. We know that there is a God. We know that that God has given us the Bible and that it is his word. And that in his word, he reveals to us the problem of sin and the solution in Jesus. He points us to a savior, a savior who is the eternal son of God and the savior who takes away the sin of all the world. When we understand those questions are answered by scripture, we realize we have reason to rejoice, to give God thanks for what he has done for us, that he has fulfilled his promise of salvation in the person of Jesus. Thanks be to God for the deliverance that he has won, for the hope that is now ours, and the forgiveness which sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Please rise for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you have made all things in heaven and on earth to serve your will and to witness to your glory and goodness. And so we give you joyful thanks for the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the salvation which you have provided for all people through him. With repentant hearts, we turn to you. We acknowledge our transgressions, and we confess that we have failed to do the good which we should have done, and that we have often done the evil which we should have avoided. Forgive us, and stir us to a sense of the gravity of our sins. Awaken us to our need of daily repentance and renewal. And by your grace, deliver us from temptations and all that cause us to fail. Cleanse the work of our hands and the thoughts of our hearts through the working of your Holy Spirit. Come to heal and to renew us. Grant us the assurance of the forgiveness of our sins through our Lord Jesus, so that as forgiven, believers, we might have that peace which passes all understanding. O Lord, we also pray for those who are wounded in spirit, for those who are distressed of mind or anguished in heart. Let your mercy and your grace shine upon them. For all who are away from home or in any service or calling, in particular for those who are serving our country overseas during this holiday season, we ask you to accompany them with your light and love. For those who are captives or prisoners, for those who are desolate or forsaken, for those who are in danger either of life or soul, we ask for your aid and comfort. For those who are sick or elderly, for those who are dying or those who are mourning their passing, be especially gracious, O Lord. Lift up their spirits and give them the perfect peace of your holy child, Jesus in thanks for that gift which no words can describe, the gift of Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray, Father, to keep us steadfast, that we might evermore hold dear this gift by faith. Grant that our hearts may be a fit dwelling place for your Son, and that we might know the joy of his presence, the blessing of following in his steps, and the glory of that crown which he has promised to all who trust in him alone. All of these things we ask in his name, in which we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing and promise of our triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll close with the singing of hymn 60 in the Red Hymnal.